Welcome back to Fudge Muppet. My name is Scott, and today we've got something special. You see, we've been doing Skyrim builds since 2013, and well, we have most definitely improved over the years. I was going through some of our oldest builds, and I found a five minute build called the Ronin. Yes, our old builds were really short, and well, I really liked the concept of this. A wandering high elf Ronin with a dark past, seeking a brighter future. And so especially with some mods and a helping hand full of adjustments, we have made a fully remastered Ronin build for you guys to enjoy. If you've been right into that lone swordsman vibe, well, this balanced and determined warrior will fit your roleplaying needs. All the mods used are in the description, but let's get to know the Ronin a little bit better. His name before his wandering was Rultarion. 300 years he has lived, 300 years he can remember. The elves of Alanor can recall every moment with a clarity most perfect. Every triumph, every shortcoming, every deed be that proud or petty. And so shame is not so easily forgotten in the Isle of the Ultima. Rultarion was the esteemed child of two Sapiarchs, those who were the sages of the Crystal Tower, instructors to heirs of the throne and the finest minds of Somerset's people. They are lifelong scholars of magical and esoteric knowledge which is applied to a singular focus, a particular topic of study for which their titles are known. Rultarion's mother was the Sapiarch of naval excogitation, she who could divine the calls of birds and sense of the sea to exact a voyage most speedy and serene. His father was the Sapiarch of mythohistory with profound understanding of hundreds if not thousands of powerful artifacts, and a master enchanter himself. With such a pedigree ancestry, it would follow that Rultarion was groomed to become a Sapiarch like his forefathers. He had a duty to fulfill, a legacy to uphold, but such burdens do not square neatly on the shoulders of a child. He bore the curiosity, yet lacked the focus. He possessed the willpower, but not the direction. Every moment he could, he slipped away to the sea cliffs, racing across their lip where the winds carried him running to the coral beaches blessed by the rays of Auriel. He rolled in the waves, kicked in the sand, and left at dusk, mouth parched by salt. And each time his parents would discover his sundry misdemeanors, they would tighten their watch and recruit more neighbors to their network of spies, set on the mission of forestalling his freedom. In time, he could not lift a finger without the knowing of his parents, and so his spirit was tamed, and to the books he was bound. By age 30, he had been moulded into a dutiful scholar, pursuing a place amongst the Sapiarchs. His knowledge of the natural world was vast, and his parents thought he would pursue alchemy or zoology. But while from the outside he appeared a refined student and prospective Sapiarch, he could not align his true calling with the path that laid before him. Each time he was by the beach collecting samples of coral and seaweed for his studies, he would linger just a moment too long his gaze transfixed on the horizon where the sea and sky hid his freedom. One day while at the beach, restrained and proper in his study of the shellfish which clung to the rocks, he was most suddenly disturbed. A shambled old elf called out and startled him. She was an apraxic, that much was clear. Her frailness was poorly hidden by sea-worn rags that draped her shoulders. Her milky eyes drifted to the left as if she could only see him in her peripheral. Rultarion thought before speaking, her kind, the banished and disgraced, were not to be spoken to by Ultima in good standing, yet his curiosity did not permit him to turn away. She spoke in dry rasps that told of his youth. She had seen him many times at this beach, full of life and luster, but she had saddened to see it wane over the years, that the fire within him seemed only a flicker fit for a candle these days. Rultarion considered carefully whether or not to speak, and an uncomfortable silence lingered as the woman's yellowed teeth began to chatter in the breeze. It was not cold, but she was clearly not of good health. His better judgement that had been refined over decades of tutelage quickly slipped away and he kindly asked her to his home for supper. Rultarion's parents spent days away at the tower or the college, and so the old lady's visit would likely be unnoticed. He fed and clothed her. Each charitable action, each word spoken, was a violation of their ways, yet her memories of him from a distance, as a youth, of his transformation, of his path of restraint, they inspired a new brightness within him, a return of spirit. He asked of her her life story, a tale of grief and beauty, a woman cast out and made a praxic for publicly cursing the king who had so flippantly sent her husband to his doom. 
He was a naval officer, sent foolishly in haste to fight a Marimar incursion without adequate intel or support. Her husband was lost at sea. The old elf spoke at length about regrets she had, that for so long she had been the perfect citizen, her children all find stock in respected positions, all of whom no longer speak to her, the fate of an apraxic. She left Rultarion with a million questions, decades of certainty dashed against the rocks and shattered into a hundred shards of curiosity. He was inspired, emboldened, and perhaps a little bit reckless. He penned a letter for his parents, packed his things, and fled into the lands beyond, a stowaway on a ship of the East Empire Company. Upon discovery, he bribed the captain with valuables and secured his safe passage, and soon he would find that his adventure would be delivering him to Morrowind. For 70 years he roamed the East, first as an alchemist in Mournhold, where he made quite the living, and paid for tutoring from a Redoran swordmaster in the arts of war. Then he became a caravan guard, then a caravan owner, carting his alchemical goods throughout the East. He soon got bored and became a mercenary of House Indoral, where he found a taste for their sujama and their fine silks. But soon the winds called him again, and he ventured through Black Marsh as a bodyguard, protecting merchants and nobles from the dangers of the swamps. His eye for the poisonous and knowledge of potions kept his clients and himself safe. Soon he ended up in Leowen, but then the Oblivion Crisis happened and everything changed. In the aftermath, Rultarian had heard of the Crystal Tower's destruction, and for the first time in his life, he had feared for his parents' well-being. Rultarion made the voyage back to Somerset, himself now an apraxic, an outcast, yet such customs were not given much thought in the present aftermath of Daedric invasion. He came to the wreckage of the fallen Crystal Tower, and when he asked after his parents, he found their names among the fallen. Solemn tears were shed as he wandered the sea cliffs of his youth. He must have wandered the entire coast, surveying the destruction and grief of Somerset, unsure what to do with his long life. The death of his parents had stirred a craving for meaning and purpose. A trivial life of adventure would no longer satisfy. By the ports of Sunholt, he found criers shouting the praises of those who ended the crisis, those who spoke of Altmeri salvation, told of a new Somerset, a government for the Altmeri people. Rultarion listened and watched. For years he helped rebuild alongside many who shared such sympathies. The Thalmor helped any Altmer, even a Praxix. In fact, they recruited many to their cause from the lowest rungs and outcasts of society. In their new vision of the Isles, the laws would be reformed and potential would be recognized in any of those who share the Ultima blood, rather than the selected of honored lineage. They espoused that they are all descendants of the great spirits of Aetherius, and their speeches found purchase among crowds of cheers and waving hands. Altarion followed his curiosity, spoke to a chain of people which led him to recruiters for their cause, and among them he found many fired spirits, burning bright for freedoms and the breaking of the past. Thalmor leaders would speak of how the elven people cannot divide themselves and further wallow in their mortal prisons. They must take action. Rultarion was enraptured by the cause. He had not only seen firsthand the relief and generosity provided by the Thalmor in the wake of the Oblivion Crisis, but he had witnessed firsthand the words of their leaders profess values of equality and freedom amongst the Ultima, an elven realm free of imperial masters and free of kings who would cower before them and enforce age-old dogmas and selective histories which make precedent for their greatness. These isles would no longer be a prison for the Ultima, and in time no longer will their mortal coils. He joined the Thalmor, furthered their cause, became a useful agent among their ranks, and he was among those at the coup of Year 22 of the Fourth Era, which seized control of the Somerset Isles, overthrew the old monarchy, and renamed the land Alanor. The Isles had been freed of the monarchy's oppression and freed of Lorcan's mortals who would infect their island. Over many decades, Rultarion would prove himself as a high-ranking member of the Thalmor, a very useful agent who took part in the coup of Valenwood, the elsewhere integration, and the removal of many Imperial Blades agents from their lands. The Great War came, the leadership of the Thalmor prepared for invasion. This was a different feeling for Rultarion. This was not about rekindling the old Aldmeri Dominion, creating a block against the incursions of Imperial Man, but about domination. His faith faltered, but it was bandaged by his mentors in time. They had to reclaim the towers. Nothing worth fighting for is easy. They had to make the hard decisions. This 
was a plan centuries in the making. He had heard every point and they made sense to him, but deep down he was out of alignment. Rultarion carried forth his orders and was amongst those who took the Imperial City under the command of Lord Narofin. But when he discovered the pact between he and the Daedric Prince Boethia, when he learnt of the ritual known as the Culling, the evils he was prepared to unleash onto the world, the armies of Daedra he was going to summon forth to ravage the lands, he could not abide this. Rultarion vanished, abandoned his fellow elves, and travelled to the east he was once familiar with and entered into a deep sorrow. Under ashen skies of a scorched Morrowind, he roamed and watched a lone warrior, Aronan. He searched for atonement in some form, helping those who could not help themselves, avoiding violence when he could, only drawing his blade as a last resort. In the decades since the Great War's end and the Imperial victory, he came back to Cyrodiil and helped those pushed into poverty by the destruction of the Great War. He would try to talk down bandits, do everything in his power to avoid violence, but at times there was no other option. One day, in the 201st year of the Fourth Era, while spending time in Bruma, he was identified somehow by the Thalmor network of spies, and he was to be killed. They could not have such high-ranking members of their regime leave and live, with such intimate knowledge of their clandestine operations. Two assassins, Khajiit masters of the Whispering Fang, made an attempt on his life. He managed to escape Bruma and head north into the Pale Pass. Cyrodiil was no longer safe for him. He made it into Skyrim, but they had tracked him, and he was forced to draw his sword against them. He pitied them in that moment. They were just following their orders. He knew they were fighting for a cause in which they believed, with the total conviction of their spirits, like he once did. They fought, and Rultarion was gravely injured, but it was the Khajiit that lay lifeless, bleeding into the snow. He limped from a one battle, only to get wrapped into another, and taken as a prisoner on a cart to Helgen. That is the backstory of the Ronin. To recap, he was born 300 years ago as a child of two Sapiarchs, yearning for a freedom that was quashed so that he could be moulded into a prospective and proper student. Yet his later encounter with an older Praxic inspired him to find his destiny beyond the horizon. He explored and adventured the east of Tamriel, but when the Oblivion Crisis hit, he returned to Somerset to find his parents dead. Inspired to bring purpose and meaning to his life, he joined the Thalmor who spoke of a new regime and of removing all limitations of mortality. For well over a century he worked with the Thalmor, but when he witnessed the lengths that they were prepared to go, he vanished and became a Ronin. The Ronin has seen a lot of things in his life. He is 300 years old, and one of the main things he has ascertained from his experiences is empathy and understanding. He knows that every man or woman thinks themselves good, the hero of their own stories. So when the Ronin faces bandits, he approaches with mercy, understanding that their condition, their environment, their influences have made them this way, and so he appeals to them first. Avoids shedding blood if he can, yet if left without a choice, the speed and grace of his blade will end them quickly. This mentality of empathy and understanding is applied to all, whether that be Stormcloaks, Imperials, Thalmor, or even Dark Brotherhood Assassins. No matter how hopeless, he would always try to understand, try to sway them from their current path. He needs to believe in mercy, he needs to believe in forgiveness, for if he cannot, with what he has done, how can he live with himself? In his time in Skyrim, he will find a particular affinity for Kinnereth, and with the Winter Sun mod, she will be his chosen patron. The Ronin connects her to the winds of his youth. He has felt her presence throughout his life and believes it is by her grace that his speed is possible. He loves to meditate in nature on the wind-chipped peaks of Skyrim, but it is important to remember, relating to his core values of empathy and understanding, he is not dogmatic in the slightest, and thinks of all religion as different understandings and as interpretations of greater personified truths. Also fitting in with the whole wind Kinnereth nature theme for this wandering swordsman, the perk Speak With Animals that I talk about later essentially lets you have animal companions, and I think the Ronan wandering Skyrim with a wolf by his side is a pretty awesome vibe. Also further entwined with Kinnereth, or rather Kine, is the Thum itself, and this will play a significant role in the playstyle of the Ronan, especially in the role-playing sense. Breath, Meditation, winds, nature, speed, grace, mercy, these are some key phrases to associate with him. 
And you can imagine that the Ronin will get on very well with the Greybeards and their philosophy of peace and the use of the thumb for spirituality, not war. But while he agrees, he cannot instinctually let the world around him turn to ruin. He will pursue his destiny as Dragonborn, and under the tutelage of Parthenax, he will master the thumb. He relates to Parthenax greatly, as their pasts are similar in some regard. Parthenax fighting against his nature and his past is not dissimilar to the Ronin atoning for his history in furthering the cause of the Thalmor and the acts justified by it. Seeking mercy and understanding for the most abhorrent of people is a constant struggle, and the Ronin at times will feel the desire to purge, a desire he must overcome. But now let's talk about factions and quests and such. Thieves Guild and Dark Brotherhood are a no-go, and I don't think the College of Winterhold is really relevant considering his only magic per se is the Thumb and his knowledge of enchanting and alchemy, but if you really wanted to join the College, it can make sense considering his history as a student and his desire for academic knowledge. But there are also the Companions. Now, this is a bit of a tricky one. It's a warrior guild that values companionship and fighting side by side, but it's very Nordic in energy. It sees violence as a way of life, and this doesn't square well with the Ronin. And also consider you have to become a werewolf, and so it's not a really good fit. So none of the main factions are a fantastic fit for the Ronin. I mean, he is a lone wandering swordsman after all. However, for a playthrough of the Ronin, the main quest, joining the Dawnguard, fighting the vampires, and the Dragonborn DLC are the ways to go. Of course, in addition to the many side quests within the game, and the many ways he can help the people in general. For example, becoming a Thane of every hold is a great goal. Not necessarily because he desires nobility, but rather because it is a reflection of his work to help the people of Skyrim. And I mean all the people. For example, he would help Freylia Greymane recover her Stormcloak son from a Thalmor prison, and at the same time he would help an Imperial do similar. He tries not to see faction, race, creed, religion, or association, but rather have empathy for the person behind the labels, and would see them free, happy, and bringing warmth to their families. But at the same time, he can recognize ill intent, and is gravely aware of the results of his actions. So for example, in the Forsworn Conspiracy, I think he would choose to kill Madanark, because while there is corruption and injustice involved, even considering the Ronin's own imprisonment, he knows that Madanark will never let go of his vengeance, and he will only incite more people to it and encourage and amplify the decades of violence and rage. The guiding light of the Ronin should be non-violence and anti-war, hence no civil war resolution, as well as mercy and forgiveness. In regards to the Daedra quests, he will most often refuse them in the cases in which they cannot be done in an ethical way. However, he is not completely anti-Daedra, and he's had much experience in Morrowind and elsewhere, and can understand the positive aspects of Daedra within their archaic spiritualities, the pre-Riddlethar pantheon for the Khajiit, and the good Daedra for the Dunmar. For example, in the case of Azura, it could make sense to me that the Ronin does return the star to Azura herself, because he can see all the good she has done. Done. Yet in the case of Boethia, for example, he would simply refuse the quest. In cases like Malakath or Hercene, these are pretty easy to play mercifully. Especially in the case of Sinding, the Ronin would agree to him hiding away from civilization and seeking a peaceful life despite his condition. I also want to throw out another concept, which is the respect and love of nature, which in part can be seen with the worship of Kinnereth and the Speak With Animals perk, but also his love of flora and its magical components. He is an accomplished alchemist of potions and will seek to understand and study all the amazing ingredients and concoctions and salves that can be made with them. I feel now that between the backstory and this role-playing section, you should be very familiar with the essence of the Ronin's character, and so should be able to navigate most of Skyrim's decisions authentic to his personality and values. But with that said, now let's get to the statistical stuff. Time to talk race standing stone stats and also winter sun. We typically use the minimalistic suite of Inacion Skyrim mods, Valkyrie for perks, even star for standing stones, morning star for races, but with religion we like the winter sun mod for its role playing variety. Mod links are in the description. So race, he's an ultima, which with morning star grants him 50 extra magicka and 50% faster magicka regen. 
almost entirely irrelevant for this build. The Ronin is an Ultima purely for role-playing reasons. The Standing Stone chosen is the Lord Stone for an armor increase of 75 and a magic resistance of 25%. Now, you could, if you like, choose the Steed Stone. It certainly fits with the theme of speed. However, I found that we are already far faster than usual with religion and perks and such, so it became a bit excessive. Diminishing returns, you could say. And the magic resistance I found far more valuable for survivability, but at the end of the day, it is up to you. For the stat spread, we will get some increases from enchanting, but I think we're going for a stamina of 200, and then after that, the rest into the health is the way to go. I found that with the combination of one-handed and light armor perks, plus the potions we have, the amount of stamina recovery options we have, it's all really good, plus enchanting should get us up to around 300, which is quite enough to take advantage of the one-handed power attack perks, but we'll talk about this stuff later. So invest 50-50 health stamina until stamina reaches a raw value of 200. Then go 100% all in on health for the rest of the game. Finally, as touched on in the role-playing section, the Ronin's chosen deity is Kinnereth, the embodiment of nature and the winds which he has an affinity for. As a follower, you will get the Wind Speaker buff, which flat out increases movement speed by 10% in combat, and as a devotee, you can pray to Kinnereth to summon a Sabercat mount, which also again fits the whole nature-loving theme. But now, onto skills and perks, where we can see some of this stuff interact for amazing results. The skills for the Ronin are one-handed block, light armor speech, enchanting, and alchemy. And all of these factor and feed into a core, simple playstyle, which is really nice. The main components here are sword fighting, the thumb, and enhancements via enchanting and alchemy. But we'll get more into that in the playstyle section. Now let's tackle each skill and their perk separately. Starting with the bread and butter of this build, we have the one-handed skill with the perks, one-handed mastery, disciplined fighter, furious strength, valorous charge, crater maker, disarming slash, overpowering assault one of two, execute, and victory rush. These are solid, straightforward perks, but I really like execute from a role-playing perspective here. Power attacks with a sword, execute a target below 20% health, inflicting a critical strike for 10 times critical damage. It really feeds into the quick and painless and merciful type of death that the Ronin deals. Also, there's Disarming Slash. One-handed sideways power attacks have a 25% chance to disarm targets, inflicting a critical strike for two times critical damage. The idea of a skillful swordsman disarming enemies is timeless. But at the end of the tree, Victory Rush takes the cake for usefulness, restoring 100 stamina on a kill with a one-handed weapon, and at the rate this guy cuts through his enemies, we should have zero stamina problems. One-handed covers striking with a sword offensively, but block covers the defense. The skill is here, but the perks are quite scarce because we are only blocking with a weapon, no shield. We get block mastery, weapon block, which increases weapon block effectiveness by 25%, and quick reflexes, which will further help us maneuver around our enemies, carried by the winds of Kinnereth. It would feel silly to be a swordsman who cannot effectively defend himself with his blade. Light Armor is the protection we shall be wearing, and the perks are Light Armor Mastery, Light Armor Fit, Agility, Keen Senses, Wind Runner, Light Armor Training, Matching Set, War Dancer, Tough Hide, Evasive Sprint, and Untouchable. The standouts here are most certainly Keen Senses, so that we can reap the benefits while maintaining fashion first and not wearing a helmet. Wind Runner, which allows us to move 10% faster when wearing all light armor, which of course we are with the effect of the Keen Senses perk. War Dancer, which increases all attack damage by 20%, including crit damage while wearing light armor. However, taking an unblocked hit disables this effect for 10 seconds. But again, we are moving fast and we can block well. So generally, 20% more damage should be in effect. But on top of all of this speed and damage, we have more speed. Lightning McQueen levels. The untouchable perk allows us to move an additional 15% faster in combat while wearing light armor. However, the caveat for this super speed boost is that like the War Dancer perk, taking an unblocked hit will disable the effect for 10 seconds. But that is the core skills done, let's look at the support. First up, and straightforward enough, is enchanting. Perks are enchanting mastery, armor enchanter, regalia enchanter, and extra effect. In short, this allows us to get stronger enchanting effects, and also place two effects on each piece of gear. 
Speech is what gives us the ability to tame an animal and make it more effective in combat, but it also increases our shouting effectiveness. The perks are Speech Mastery, Speak to Animals, Beast Master, Tonal Harmony, Words of Power 2 of 2, Scold, and Dover Zulan. In short, powerful shouts and powerful animal companions. And finally we have alchemy which gives this character a little bit of a witcher feel, drinking tinctures, enhancing his focus before he fights enemies at dizzying speeds. The perks chosen are alchemy mastery, physician, benefactor, slow metabolism 2 of 2, stimulants, adrenaline, experimenter, green thumb, purity and double toil and trouble. Many of these perks you should be somewhat familiar with from vanilla such as experimenter, however instead Instead of multiple ranks, a single perk point allows you to discover all the alchemical effects of an ingredient when trying it. And I really like this for the Ronin who will discover new magical aspects of nature as he explores it. Most often we are going to use alchemy to make one handed and health potions but the awesome effects of the perk adrenaline kicks in here more speed. Adrenaline makes it so that while we're under the beneficial effects of food or a potion, you move 10% faster. This character has so much speed, which is why I just think the Steed Stone is excessive. 10% from Windrunner, 15% from Untouchable, 10% from Adrenaline, 10% from Kinnereth, and we haven't even talked about gear yet. But I think that is all the skills and perks knowledge you need. Let's move on to the gear. The weapon for the Ronin is of course a katana, but more specifically, ideally we want to get Dragonbane, since we shall be killing many dragons while protecting the people of Skyrim, and it just looks so cool with the Unique's Uniques mod that overhauls the aesthetic of the blade. In its ideal form, it will be doing 40 extra points of damage to dragons and 10 points of shock damage to others. To clarify, the main appeal here is the aesthetic and that it is themed around the killing of dragons and the actual damage will be modified greatly by our perks, our enchantments and our potions. Now, you may remember in the backstory section, during the Ronin's first wandering of Morrowind, before he returned to Somerset after the crisis, he developed a taste for House Inderil's Sujama and Fine Silks. And well, that that is why we're using the Inderil Wayfarer armor from the mod Armors of the Volothi Part 1. It just has this perfect Ronin look in my opinion. Eschewing the Heavy Blades armor or a more ready for war feel, this Wayfarer armor is the perfect blend of battle ready and casual for a wandering swordsman. The aesthetic speaks for itself. Plus it has the Japanese influences throughout its design which further connects it to the theme of the build. Let's have a look how I enchanted this all. The armor is enchanted with buffs to health and stamina, the boots have an increase to one-handed damage and frost resistance, since frost can drain our stamina and slow us down, it is definitely the most annoying of the elements to face for this build, so we keep buffed against it. The gauntlets increase our one-handed damage and make our potions more powerful with a boost to alchemical effectiveness. The necklace, which can really be any you choose, is also enchanted with one-handed and alchemy boosts, but the ring gets even funnier. I love speed. And so we pick the Ring of the Wind, which makes us another 15% faster. I told you the Steed Stone would be entirely unneeded. However, all this speed does make it so we can easily avoid blows and hence keep our additional speed from Untouchable plus the 20% more damage from War Dancer up and going. But that covers all of the gear. Let's talk about spells, consumables, and shouts and such. Okay. So no spells, but we are going to use shouts. You can really use any variety you like. Classic Unrelenting Force, Whirlwind Sprint, Ice Form, the list can go on. However, I personally really like to use Dragon Aspect for the aesthetic and just the added benefits from the buffs, but also the Cyclone Shout. For the fast moving wind theme, I just love shouting out great cyclones, tossing archers from their towers, and with the great speed of the character just moving like a gale of blades through flying winds, it's just so awesome. I would additionally lead towards things like Storm Call or Frost Breath, even Elemental Fury if you choose to use an unenchanted katana. Mainly anything that connects well with the winds and speed theme here. And finally we need to discuss potions. There are many ways to skin the cat here, but the most basic straightforward option is a one-handed increase potion. Personally I like to combine one-handed boosts and health replenishing in a single potion, making sure you're equipped at the start of every battle. But let's talk playstyle and you'll see what I mean. Okay, so you're the Ronin, wandering the wilds of Skyrim and bandits approach. 
You try to see if they can be reasoned with, of course they cannot, and so after taking a humble blow you back up and drink a potion of fortify one handed and restore health, which brings you up to speed. Use dragon aspect and then the cyclone shout or unrelenting force, clear some room for yourself and get ready to turn into a flurry of blade strikes, zooming between each bandit, killing them quickly and with clinical efficiency, with no hatred or malice, and with each kill you gain stamina back further, feeding into your unbelievable prowess. Perhaps your wolf companion joins the fray and helps keep some of the bandits distracted and helps control the crowd. At the end of the day, the actual playstyle is very simple, as a sword-wielding warrior, a ronin. But with all the many buffs and enchantments and potions and perk choices, we really do have an incredible ronin of speed and grace, and it's just an overall really fun playstyle. But that is all I have to say on the Ronin build. Thank you so much for watching, and I really hope you enjoyed the remastered Ronin build, though in all honesty, it may as well be a reboot, considering that only the vague concept was adhered to. Let me know in the comments below which of our other old builds could use a refresher, a remaster, a reboot even, an adaption for mods and Creation Club content that came with the Anniversary Edition. After 10 years of Skyrim, the modding options out there are just incredible, and there is so much potential to take old builds and give them a whole new life. I do have a fantastic new Morag Tong build concept as well as a far more effective Sand Demon build as well as concepts for many others but please do get into the comments and let us know what you'd like to see. Thank you so much for watching. Please like the video because it really helps us out. Subscribe for more Skyrim builds and Elder Scrolls lore and if Starfield turns out to be as good as it could be then there will be many new and creative builds that we will make for the sci-fi universe. Thanks again, my name's Scott, and I'll be back to nerd out with you again next time.